In 2013, the book The Satin Man, Uncovering the Mystery of the Missing Beaumont Children, was published. The book was written by author Alan Whitaker and researcher Stuart Mullins after six years of exhaustive investigation into the 1966 disappearance. The authors uncovered a new unknown lead in the Beaumont disappearance, a wealthy factory owner with a penchant for satin and deviant sexual behavior who lived just a few hundred meters from Glen Elk Beach. After interviewing the man's son and other individuals who claimed to be the suspect's victims, Whitaker and Mullins began to zero in on the salacious new target. The man was Harry Phipps. Despite the book intentionally leaving him nameless, his son, Hayden, exposed his name when the book was published. This is the story of Harry Phipps, the Satin Man. While he was never officially charged with any crimes and his abuses are only alleged, we keep the accusers and possible victims of Phipps in our thoughts and prayers. This video will diverge from the previous videos for a few reasons. As mentioned earlier, Harry Phipps was never convicted of any serious crimes. There are accusers of Phipps, but these people did not speak publicly until Whitaker and Mullins began their research in 2006, and their accusations weren't public until 2013. The accusations did not lead to charges because Harry Phipps died in 2004, nearly a decade before the accusers came forward. This is not to say that Phipps is innocent of the crimes, or that we do not believe the victims, only that there is not a legal conviction or definitive proof of his crimes. Additionally, as Phipps' relevance as a suspect only came after his death, any effort to interview him regarding these crimes had passed before he became a suspect. Any digging into his background is also, now, nearly impossible. Here is what we do know about Harry Phipps' life. Phipps was born on July 1, 1917. He owned a factory in Adelaide and was married. He had at least two children with his wife, including Hayden Phipps. Harry had a sexual obsession with satin. He wore bright-colored satin clothing, often cross-dressing, as a way to sexually excite himself. After his death in 2004, his wife got rid of his satin outfits, telling friends that they had no idea what Mrs. Phipps had had to live with. Hayden Phipps told Mullins in 2007 that his father began molesting him when he was three years old, in the early 1950s. The abuse lasted until Hayden was 13 years old. An Anglican archbishop in Adelaide also claimed to be aware of Harry Phipps' sexual deviancy in the 1950s. The archbishop, John Hepworth, claims he was abused as an altar boy in this time period, and that Phipps moved in similar circles as his abusers. According to Hepworth, this would indicate his involvement in a pedophile ring. He claims to have reported Phipps to the authorities, but to no avail. Two more accusers would come forward years after the release of the book. Both alleged that Harry Phipps had assaulted them when they were minors in the 1970s. Both accusers claimed that Phipps molested them in his factory, Castelloy Cottages. Both accusers were young girls at the time, and their names have not been released. One of the accusers claimed to have reported the incident to police shortly after its occurrence, but nothing became of her complaint. The Phipps's house was mere meters from Glen Elk Beach and Collie Reserve. Phipps was known to visit Glen Elk Beach. Harry Phipps died in 2004 in private but apparently normal circumstances. He left a widow and at least two sons, Hayden and Wayne. Whitaker and Mullins proposed the theory that Harry Phipps was the Beaumont abductor through a string of several coincidences. They built a cohesive narrative on what happened to the Beaumont children on the day of their abduction in 1966. Their story is primarily based on the accusations of Hayden Phipps, who contacted them in 2007. The authors assert that Phipps, whose home was near Glen Elk Beach, was a frequent visitor of the location in the 1960s. They claim that Phipps had met the Beaumont children before and had begun to groom them. As you may recall, the Beaumonts had visited the beach the day before their disappearance. This would explain the Beaumonts' familiarity with the blonde man, and Arna's statement that Jane had a boyfriend on the beach. Being a local, Phipps would have traveled light to the beach. He would not have a wallet, bag, car, or anything else, as he could walk to his house in only a few moments' time. This corroborates witnesses who stated that they didn't remember the man having anything but the towel and his swim trunks. Whitaker and Mullins also allege that Phipps handed $1 notes to children. 
We know that Jane gave the baker at Wenzel's Bakery a $1 note, and that their mother had only given her pocket change, so she must have gotten the money from someone else. Witnesses recalled the blonde man asking if the children's things had been rummaged through, as they were missing money. The authors claim Pip stole the money himself, as a manipulation technique to get the Beaumonts to rely on him. Jane bought a lot of food at Wenzel's, including items the familiar shopkeeper had not seen her purchase before. The amount she purchased is more likely to feed six children as opposed to only three, further indicating that the blonde man had given her the money and instructions on what to purchase. The last confirmed sighting of the children was near the changing rooms at Collie Reserve. Phipps's house was a mere two blocks behind these changing rooms, and the authors believe they were heading towards Phipps's home. Phipps taking the children a short distance to the house also follows police belief that the blonde man had not taken the children far from the scene of the crime before murdering them. Hayden was 15 years old at the time and claims that he saw the Beaumont children in the backyard. He also claims to know where his father killed and buried them, Castelloy Cottages, his factory. Hayden claims the bodies are in a sand pit near the factory. Whitaker and Mullins would interview two brothers who claimed to have been contracted by Phipps to dig a hole on the property just three days after the Beaumont children disappeared. The two claim the hole was roughly two meters wide, two meters long, and one meter deep. They stated they were paid in one dollar notes, and that Phipps had told them to leave and never return, in coarser language. The authors claim that the Beaumont children can be found at this hole, but even if they weren't found there, Phipps had an alternate site where he could have disposed of the bodies. This site was another cottage that was forbidden to workers, where Phipps supposedly kept his beloved satins, and where some believe he deposited the Beaumont's belongings. It is possible that Phipps did not use the hole for the purpose of disposing of the Beaumont's bodies, instead opting to incinerate them, or to throw them into a trash pit. The popularity of the book, the victim confessions that were reported after the book's publication, and a slew of other coincidences known only to the police encouraged them to consider Phipps a suspect in 2017. Upon release of the book and the additional findings, Whitaker and Mullins championed the idea that they had solved the Beaumont abduction. Based on the facts of the case and the information revealed regarding Phipps, their investigation work seemed like a home run. However, this was not the case, and there are significant holes in their theory. The first and most obvious was the excavation of the Castelloy Cottage's factory. In 2013, a small one-meter area of the factory was excavated based on the testimony of the two boys who claimed to have dug the hole for Harry Phipps. Initial reports from the ground-penetrating technology indicated a small anomaly, meaning there was movement or objects under the soil. Nothing was found once the ground was dug up, however. Five years later, in 2018, South Australian police returned to the factory to excavate other locations, ostensibly believing there to be evidence of the Beaumont children in these sites. This nine-hour excavation did yield bones, but they were determined to be animal bones, and nothing relevant to the Beaumont case was found. No further excavations have been made at the factory to this point, and police have stopped following the Harry Phipps lead. If the Beaumont children were abducted by Phipps, and their bodies thrown in a trash pit or incinerated, evidence of their presence at the factory is likely impossible to determine. Another hole in the theory regarding Harry Phipps is the total lack of direct evidence. All of what Phipps is alleged to have done comes from witness testimony, most notably from Hayden Phipps. It is estimated that only 2-10% to of people who report that they were abused as children are lying about their experiences, but Hayden is notable for his severe mental health problems. Hayden has struggled with substance abuse, failed relationships, mood swings, anxiety, depression, self-harm, and rage throughout his life. Hayden also openly despised his father, and relatives throughout the decades did not understand why this was the case. All of this could certainly be explained by Harry's abusive behaviors, but Hayden's family seems to think differently. Wayne Phipps claims his father was innocent, and that Hayden was making up the allegations. This doesn't explain why the other two accusers came forward, nor does it explain why the Archbishop believes Harry Phipps was involved in a pedophile ring. It is possible that Phipps was a pedophile, but this does not mean that he abducted the Beaumont children. Further holes in the theory regard how Harry Phipps, a wealthy businessman in the area, was not identified by witnesses. Phipps resembled the identikit, 
though this does not hold up as evidence given the problems with the rendering. However, some of the witnesses must have recognized him as both a wealthy business owner and a local who frequented Glenelg. Additionally, the blonde man was not recognized after speaking to numerous different individuals regarding the children's belongings. This would presumably make him even more recognizable to local witnesses. Even if the witnesses were unfamiliar to Phipps, it still seems unwise for a criminal local to the area to make himself so easily identifiable. Phipps was also significantly older than the blonde man as initially reported by witnesses at around 48 years old. Most reports put the blonde man in his 20s or 30s. Additionally, Phipps had light brown hair, not blonde hair. However, this may have been merely an inadequate description on the witness's part. Harry Phipps died in 2004, so any explanation or alibi he could provide will never be known. He was around 87 years old at the time of his death and had no discernible criminal history, as the allegations only came to the forefront in 2013. The most recent allegations against him occurred in the 1970s. It's extremely rare for a serial child abuser to stop his behavior without police intervention, yet there are no allegations or evidence of abuse for the last 30 years of Phipps' life. Stuart Mullins is a researcher, but he is not an investigator with a police background. As such, he was not privy to inside workings regarding the Beaumont case. While it is not impossible for independent researchers to break cases or identify new suspects, it does remove some credibility to Mullins' reporting. However, the man was successful in bringing a new possibility to the police's attention, even if the police ultimately found nothing of interest when investigating Phipps. Alan Whitaker had written a book about the Beaumonts prior to the 2013 novel. When pressed about his book, Whitaker claims he's not an investigator, only a writer. The book and Harry Phipps's implied guilt sparked legal action from Wayne Phipps and Harry Phipps's widow in 2013. It is unclear if a lawsuit was ever pursued or was dropped when police officially declared Phipps a major suspect. Wayne Phipps still proclaims his father's innocence, while Hayden still proclaims his guilt. It appears as though police have ceased their investigation into Harry Phipps. Harry Phipps is a difficult suspect to cover. There is no direct evidence that Phipps ever committed the crimes he was accused of committing, and while there is plenty of circumstantial evidence, much of it is based on the words of a less than trustworthy accuser. Whether Phipps was the monster he is claimed to be, or whether he is innocent, we can certainly sympathize with a family who are either victims of a monster, or are currently victims of false information.